I'm a little intoxicated in the spirit. It's good. It's a good drop. It's good. Hallelujah. Come on. You just lean into it. If you just feel a bit of the presence of God, then you just you just let go. Just go, come on, give me more. Whatever you have, you're hungry, and He'll fill you. Praise God. We can uh, take a seat, or if you want to, you can lay on the floor. Do whatever you want. There is freedom in the house. Hurra, Baba. But don't leave his presence. Just let him hit you in your seat. Just let him get you wherever you are. Just let the presence sink down. It's good things happening. Hallelujah. Pastor Joel. Why don't you come tell us what's happening? Yeah. Amen. Come and just love his presence. Why don't you just lift your hands to him right now? Thank you, Father, for your glory, for your power. Right now, in Jesus' name. We just bask, we just bake <laughs> in your glory. Thank you, Father. We just soak it in. Thank you, Jesus. Just let him wash over you right now. Father, we just fall more in love with you. Let us be carriers of your glory and your presence. So come on, it's just beginning to increase right now. Just reach out to him, Lord. And thank you, Father. We just want more. We just want more. We just want more. Come, Holy Spirit. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let's just take a deep breath. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You could probably kill this mic in the, on, the, on the stage. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Amen. Man, I'm just... <laughs> We're going to have a good night. We've had a good night. Thank you, Father. Pastor Catherine is uh, having some well-earned holidays uh, with the family. And um, we just bless her. Why don't you just... Uh, just point your hand towards the camera at the back. Just begin to pray for her. Lord, we thank you, Father, for Pastor Catherine, Tom, and the whole entire family. Lord, we just bless them. Lord, we speak favor in Jesus' mighty name. Lord God, we thank you, Father, Father for what you're doing. And we just thank you for a, a refreshing holiday in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got some incredible friends uh, with us all the way back from WIPA. And uh, Sean and Rochelle, why don't you give them a big hand? If you guys want to come up and just give us a brief something, yeah, brief greeting, download, tell us what's been happening. Yeah, give them a big hand. Awesome. Hey, guys. Hey, how's everyone? Good? <laughs> well, um, for the last year, we've been up in Weepa, which is right at the top of Australia. Pretty much, um, yeah, almost as far as you can go. And um, I've been working in uh, the boarding school there and, um, and also got the job as a chaplain in the, the, the school. And Rochelle's been working as a guidance officer in the school. And uh, it's been... Um, an amazing journey, it really has. It's been very challenging um, being away from church family. And it's been um, uh, very pioneering, you know, going to a new environment, an uh, environment that uh, 
uh, in many ways has not been touched by um, uh, the kingdom of God in a, in, a, in a powerful way. So it has just been um, learning that love is patient, especially when you have 25 uh, teenage uh, indigenous and islander boys. And um, we, it's just been, yeah, just learning, learning to love, learn to be just, um, love is just so practical sometimes. It is, sometimes it's washing sheets and making beds and teaching um, boys to become men. It is, uh, and it's teaching uh, as well young ladies to become women. And it's, it, it's, it's daily conversations. It's, um, it, yeah, it's been, it's been incredible. We've, I've seen from, um, yeah, and, and then just, just seeing uh, God move in the place, you know, uh, step by step through, through prayer and, through, and learning, okay, you know, it's a spiritual battle and learning how, you know, from days where we've just spent hours praying and then seeing the next day radical change in the boarding school where we've had up to 10 or 12 kids just start asking for prayer randomly and just asking for and just telling them about dreams they're having, and just telling them about visions they're having. Go, they, they're so spiritually open up there. You 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 pray for them. You go, hey, well, what do you see? And they just they'll go on to a whole list of, you know, they just they just see and feel the God of prayer, like God, and they believe. And uh, so that was just really encouraging to to see and experience and and go into just new territory. We've been going to the local community there and community and just uh, playing games and sitting literally in the dirt and playing with kids and. Um, it's um, a lot of the kids call me Jesus in the school, <laughs> which is is um, yeah really funny and rather awkward sometimes. Uh, and some of the teachers introduce me sometimes as that, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. And you get little year ones, and they go, ah, oh. I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we even had a, a school fight, and um, I was right there. So I had to break up these two kids, and like they were just going at each other. And the police came in and they had to do reports, and um, and it ended up with um, the the kids giving um, a, a report on what happened. And they're like, "Oh yeah, so so and so jumped in, and they were fighting, fighting, and then Jesus stepped in." And they, <laughs> the police are going, okay, "What?" And like it took, and then so this it's on file and report that Jesus stepped in to save this fight. <laughs> And um, they figured out later it was the school chaplain that got involved. So um, it just, yeah, it, it opened doors. Um, uh, yeah, it's been, been awesome. Very, um, yeah, Rochelle's done an amazing job. We've seen uh, changes as well in the, the teachers there. And um, Rochelle has got a new job as well. she would be going even further north to um, a place called Bamaga which is pretty much, if you take a jump a meter forward, you end up in PNG pretty much. So it's, it's right on the tip of Cape York. Um, and she's being promoted to a guidance officer position there. And um, I'll, be, I'll be in Weeper for another uh, term or so. And, um, and then we'll be going. And then uh, I'll be going up there. Um, and also announced that we got engaged last night as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it, I guess. Um, love to catch up with everyone here, and yeah, it'll be awesome. Good to be back. We've been missing this place a lot. So. We have been incredibly missing this place. Um, you, it's, I guess you don't know what you have until it's not around. Um, you don't know the momentum that you have until you have to create your own, um, which has been really challenging and learning. And um, I, But that being all being said, I would totally recommend um, being a God yes person um, and, and just taking a leap of faith. And um, we've had two amazing people come and join us, um, dear friends of mine um, who have journeyed a long time with me. Um, they also went to Heidi Baker's school and, and just uh, laid down lovers and we couldn't have done it without them and also the community here that have been praying for us. So I really want to say thank you to those who have thought of us often and, and prayed for us because when you're up in environments like that, it, it is a line between surviving and not surviving and doing well and not doing well. So thank you so much for that. And um, if anyone's really got it stirring on their heart to, to um, reach out to the 
inside of Australia, um, please come and talk to us because there's lots of exciting things up there and lots of opportunities. And one thing I will ask you guys as a family to pray into, I, all year we've been trying to get um, a program called Love and Logic for the school. Um, it's basically God's grid on how to love kids and and parent them and teach them and all that kind of thing. You may have um, been exposed to it through Danny Silk, um, his program that he does, um, Loving Our Kids on Purpose. Um, the school's just taken a seed, um, It literally two days before we left, and, and they're really keen to start doing that. And this is God's grid for loving kids. And so, you know, we, we can see that place being turned around in a day if it if the adults can learn how to love really well. And so I'd really ask you guys to, to um, help us protect that seed with prayer and also protect um, our beautiful friends Tale and Dave and Sean as they go back to Weeper. And as I head up the dirt track, which is the next suburb over, which is six hours dirt track up, up the peninsula even further. So, um, yeah, your prayers mean the world to us. So thank you, and we continue to thank you. And, yeah, if anyone wants to join the fun, come and have a chat to us. So we love you, and, um, yeah, miss you guys so much. So good to see you. Amen. It's so good to have you guys back. Just to let you know a couple things, um, we, uh, Sunday's going to be amazing. Pastor Chris Turner is going to be preaching on Sunday. It'll be great. And uh, we got Outbreak Camp that's coming up in uh, January. And we finally finished, officially uploaded it today, the, uh, the Outbreak Camp video. Would you like to see it? It's about two and a half minutes. And uh, yeah, go ahead and roll that. God took out my heart and put His in there. I was on my knees and I was just going, Jesus, Jesus. And I wanted Him more than anything. And as soon as I stopped crying, all the burden and the heaviness from my heart disappeared. And I was laughing. I just saw it lips. It was like I saw just a sliver of His face and it just... It felt like it clicked. I was like, this love. I was just undone. And then I saw Jesus' face. He said, all your pain's gone. I love you. <laughs> and he watched it all away. <laughs> I thought I knew what love felt like, but I had no clue what love felt like. Today is the day of destiny. Go after the promise. To be one, cities to be saved, families to be made whole, and a generation to walk in who they're called to be. And I thank you, God, for the great reformation that you're releasing in this nation, God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for sons and daughters of revival, sons and daughters of a revolution of love. Amen. Does that excite you or what? That looks like nation changing stuff right there. You can go ahead and hit those lights. Thank you so much. So that's the 7th to the 10th of January, and you can, uh, you can still register for that, but there's only limited spots. And then after that, we have our normal Christian Life Conference with Todd White, which is the 19th to the 21st of January, which is just going to be totally out outrageous, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three full days of life-changing 
stuff. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Uh, we're going to take up our tithes and offerings. Well, actually, first, before we do that, uh, we want to welcome everybody that's new here. Could we just grab the other house, house lights as well? Thank you. Um, anybody that's here for the first time, could you just put your hand up so that we can give you a big warm welcome? Over here, this row, give them a big hand. Anybody else? A brother over here in this row, a sister on the front there. Come on, I think you can do better than that. Amen. Um, if you've received a form, there should be a, cough, a free coffee that, that should entitle uh, you to one of those on Sunday. Also, a prophetic booth, fast pass, that you can come at uh, 320 and uh, to the house of prayer there, and they will pro- people will prophesy over you and be blessed. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and take up our tithes and offerings. Uh, how many need a breakthrough in finances? If you need a breakthrough, why don't you stand to your feet? Father, we just thank you for just complete breakthrough in finances in the name of Jesus and every single person, Lord God, that needs a breakthrough. I thank you, Father, that you have called us not to be the tail, but you've called us to be the head in Jesus' mighty name. Lord God, I thank you, Father, that you're opening the windows of heaven and that you're pouring out your blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Have we got that prayer? If you just stand with us, we're going to pray this prayer. Pastor Chris, would you, would you pray this uh, uh, prayer with us? Hallelujah. All right, let's just pray it together. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessings and increase. Thank you for meeting all of my financial need so that I have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You can wake, make your way to the front. I think this is what we're doing now. Uh, we've got the, the uh, buckets up there. Yes, also we have the direct deposit details uh, up on the screen there if you would like to pay that way. That would be awesome. We just got back from Sydney, Nathaniel and I. Uh, we had our very first Normal Christian Life conference down there. And uh, if you get to hang out with, with Nathaniel any period of time, uh, it, you're guaranteed to see multiple miracles, multiple signs and wonders and miracles. And uh, we were just out on Wednesday, and, and um, I think we were going to pick some stuff up from the church, and we were doing a little bit of filming here at the church. And um, when we went over to Kelvin Grove, I just needed to grab something to eat. And Nathaniel was coming with us to Zambrero's, and he makes a beeline for this guy. He just takes off, as he normally does. And as he takes off, uh, I didn't know where he went. I tried to look, look for him all over the place. I drive around the block. And then he comes back about 20, 30 minutes later. I said, Nathaniel, where have you been? He says, God's taken him into this new, this new stage where he's not only just sharing to people that he's meeting, but he's, God is beginning to highlight to him certain specific individuals who re- there's a real tug on his heart and he'll, go, he'll make a beeline after them. And so when we were, on the pl- uh, when we were about to board our plane on, on uh, Thursday, just at the Brisbane airport, um, and Nathaniel's sharing to a whole bunch of different people. I think that we, I got to pray for a guy, problem with his leg, and he got healed, and then Nathaniel's giving a prophetic word to somebody else, and uh, Farmas is out there, and he's praying for different people. And this is going on for a whole hour while we're waiting for a plane. And this, a guy comes out, I hadn't seen him before, a guy comes out, of, out from the back, and he comes, comes towards Nathaniel, and he goes, he goes, I've been watching you for an hour. And this is the same guy that he met on Wednesday. You think about it. There's two million people in the city of Brisbane, down in Kelvin Grove. God leads, leads, uh, puts on his heart to go after this guy. This is the same guy that had been watching Nathaniel. And he's, and he's just watching the, basically the normal Christian life. And he goes, Nathaniel, I looked you up since you gave me that word last, uh, on Wednesday. I was so impacted by it. I googled your name. I've investigated the school. I'm going to be doing the school. This guy's not even a Christian. He's saying, I'm going to do the supernatural school. <laughs> he's totally like rocked by it. And, and he's just watching the normal Christian life. He's like, I have to have this. He hasn't even given his heart to the Lord. <laughs> this is what the normal Christian life looks like. 
And uh, we got down to Sydney, and it was amazing to see people even within about two days completely activated to go out in the streets and uh, people that have been nervous. How many saw Jill's episode? Enjoyed Jill's episode. She says, you know, I didn't believe that I was called to it. I didn't believe that it was my ministry. But then I got out, out there in the streets, and he goes, everybody's called to this. This is amazing. It's not because we have to do it. We get to do this. We get to manifest Christ. And fear is never meant to be an excuse. We get to live free with perfect love that, that casts out all fear. And uh, when we were down there, we got to, um, uh, one lady actually watched Jill's episode and came and drove all the way across town. She'd never given her heart to the Lord, came and sat through the whole uh, normal Christian life conference thing and gave her heart to the Lord in tears and it was just beautiful. It was amazing what God was doing. So you can give the Lord a big hand. I tell you what, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited what God is doing with my heart. Uh, you know, for so many years, um, I think that there's been a sort of, I've judged my, judged my well-being or my, my ministry based on external things. But I tell you what, I have, ne- I have never been in this place that I am right now in terms of actual freedom be truly, I tell you what, I didn't even know. I wasn't even taught. I, I, you know, I've been, I've been listening to these podcasts and Dan Muller and Todd White and these guys, and, and I'm listening to this, and I'm like, this, they're actually describing what the, nor, what, not only normal Christian life, but what the born again experience is meant to be. You see, Jesus didn't just pay for our sins. It was actually so that he would reveal that we are sons and daughters of the living God, that reveal our worth because we were worth the blood of Jesus, heaven's most valuable commodity. And to actually reveal that we are, we're not just in a place of right standing with God, that righteousness is not just positional only, but we can actually begin to experientially walk this thing out free with a pure heart, free from selfish ambition, that it is actual tangible, and, but it's righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus, that we actually clothe ourselves with Christ, that we put off the old nature, that we put on Christ, that we are hidden in him. And I didn't even know for so many years in my life, even though I gave my heart to the Lord when I was five years old and I was in a missionary family, I didn't know that this was what was accessible. It's kind of like for so many years, I think people that have come to church, they have this concept that if you could just come to church once a week, pay your tithe, don't say cuss words and don't drink alcohol and do drugs, then that's what the normal Christian life is all about. Are you with me? But still, there's, there's anger in this, and there's things that are going down from this level. And Danny Silk describes it this way. He says that many, many Christians can be very judgmental to, to, to people, and they rate sin based on a scale from 1 to 10. And if people are committing a 6 or a higher, then there's a lot of judgment that's going on, but they're committing 4 and below on a daily basis. But Jesus says, be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think that there's almost been two camps where we've been split into this, where on one side, there's been the legalistic camp that beats you over the head and say, hey, look, you, you, you need a good whoop in this Sunday. So I'm just going to, you know, you're going to get beat over the head by the word of God and to tell you how dirty sinners repent for what you've done, but they never expect you to come to a place of freedom. And then there's another camp that actually has says, hey man, it doesn't really matter what you do now because we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus and this is what we are positionally. So if, if the Father sees Jesus when he sees you, it actually really doesn't matter what you do. Are you with me? So you could be sleeping with prostitutes and then you feel like, well, God does not actually care. Well, God, God does not wink at sin. You know what it says in 1, in 1 John? It says that in 1 John chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 29 If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And it goes further down to to chapter 3, verse 7. It says, "Dear, Dear children, do not let anyone among you lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is from the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man has appeared to destroy the works of the devil... No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him and they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. I I used to be like really challenged by that. I was like, you could start to fall into condemnation if you're feeling like you're not actually living up to that. Are you with me? 
I've seen people that have actually said, hey, well, the thing is, well, if, if we cannot keep on sinning, then we're going to redefine what sin really means. But earlier here, it says that sin is actually lawlessness. But in John, it ta- Jesus talks about two different types of trees. He says that a tree, a good tree will produce good fruit. And a bad tree will produce bad fruit. And I always was, I was think, man, I, I kind of feel like I'm a combination of those two trees. How is that possible? I feel like that there's some good fruit on my branches, and I feel like that there's some bad, bad fruit on my branches. Are you with me? But you see, it's about our identity and actually receiving it by faith. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue to sin so that grace will abound even more? Don't you remember that you have been baptized into Christ, into his death, and that you have been raised to a new life? How It says in the message, if, how can you continue to live in that place any longer? Reckon yourself dead to sin, that you're actually remembering that there's a remembrance and there is a belief system. You see, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But it's not just positional righteousness. I'm actually tasting this thing firsthand. When you begin to receive it by faith, you see what, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And so if you believe that all God has done is taken away everything that you've done in the past, and not actually that grace is not just, not just for taking away stuff in the past, but grace is enabling you to live in a life that is pure and contrite before God. If you don't believe that, you don't live that thing out. But if we begin to believe it, we begin to see it, because as we behold him, we become like him. Righteousness is positional. We are the righteousness in Christ Jesus. But as we begin to behold what we have, we become like him. We begin to, as in a mirror, we change from that same image from glory to glory. Come on now. I want to just, I want to touch on something here. And I I tell you what. (laughs) This is so good. It is so amazing. I I was just, um, I went out today. And uh, I just set my alarm clock uh, earlier in the, in the morning, and, and, I, and I put in uh, music, uh, cr- and worship music, and I, and I just find that, that I kind of doze in and out, and, I, and as, I, as I'm listening to the, to, to the music, my, my spirit just begins to connect with God a lot more. And uh, this, this morning, as I, was, as I was doing it, I just, I just had to get out of bed, and I'm like, God, I just, I just want to seek your face. And I jumped into the car. And um, it wasn't because I was preparing a message or anything like that. It was, it was just, I just wanted more Jesus. And um, as, I, as I go down the road, I, I may actually make this little recording, and I start uh, go through the scriptures on identity, and I begin to speak it over me, and I make, make this recording with a little bit of music over it, and, I, and I'm starting to, to sleep with this, with this identity. So I'm the righteousness in Christ Jesus. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I thank you, Father, that I get to dwell in, that I get to man- manifest Christ, that I've closed myself in, in Christ. And all of these, these different verses on, on identity, I can feel my spirit just beginning to change. And I, and I tell you what, it's, it's starting to manifest. I've never felt so free in my life. I didn't even know that this realm was possible. I certainly haven't achieved that, that place of perfection because we strive to that place where, where we will actually be complete, we will be made whole, we will come into fullness. That was what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. He said, and then you will be made complete with the, with the power, with all the power that comes in Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, I love this verse, it says that it pleased God to, let's, let's read it. Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Are you there? It's like nobody turning. I'm the only one turning. (laughs) It's all right. No condemnation. (laughs) Verse, uh, here we go. So Colossians 2 verse 9, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought into fullness. I, I got I to read that again. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. I want you to think about that for a second. Here is God that is in existence in eternity past with a single spoken word speaks everything that we see into existence. Not only is his word 
was spoken, but it continues to vibrate throughout the whole known universe. Do you know there's planets that are emitting a sound? That I think there's one particular planet that emits a B-flat sound. But in him dwells the fullness of the deity in bodily form, and in Christ you've been brought into fullness. I, I, I tell you what, <laughs> there, there is so much that is accessible to us. You know what, I think many times that the issue is we, we need to know where we need to go, right? Unfortunately, many Christians think, if, if you think that this is your lot in life, if we can just kind of survive and, and you know, just not do the big, big sins and just sort of keep the little sins under, under attack, and then, then one day we're going to go to glory and then everything's going to be good. If you think that that's the place that we're going to live, that's the way that we're going to live. But if we begin to realize what's actually in the bank account, that when, 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 when Jesus died on the cross, not only were we crucified with him, not only were we buried with him, not only have we risen to life with him, we've been glorified with him, we've been seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above every rule and power and principality and authority, and we are now co-heirs with Christ, we're a partaker in the divine nature, and we get to be one with him. You see, I refuse just to, just to allow it to say, hey, I'm just going to cruise through life and just do the, the thing that seems to be normal. But when I look at the word of God, something begins to burn in my heart. I say, God, there's got to be more. And when you begin to see it, you begin to realize that it's what you were created to be and you begin to walk this thing out. I don't know what the fullness looks like, but oh boy, does it taste, it looks good. The fullness of God. Jesus. I want, to, I want to touch on a particular um, area that is just, I'm feeling freedom in my heart. You, you know what I used to think? I, I talked to my youth pastor once, and I was, a, I was the music director, and I'm like, hey, man, I just really feel that like God's called me to preach. And he says, nah, <laughs> you're the worship guy. And it devastated me. If I, I, I felt like, you know, if I could just grab a microphone, if somebody could give me a microphone, then I could walk into my destiny. I'm like, but thinking about it a few years later, I, I'm, what am I going to lead people into? If I could get a microphone, are, are you with me? Like, I didn't feel like I was living any different than anybody else. I didn't feel like that, you know, maybe, you know, if I get a microphone, okay, I'm going to be preaching on two Sundays from now, then I can get into the Word and find some kind of nuggets in there and give it to somebody that hasn't been digested. It actually doesn't produce transformation in my life, but people can go, oh, wow, that's really good knowledge. You're with me. It happens. (laughs) But I tell you what, it's more important how we're living, not on the platform, to actually demonstrate the kingdom everywhere we go because people are looking for people that are real. They're not looking for another person that has a well-articulated sermon or that can present themselves on the stage well. That's just super, that's just stardom, Christianity. That's just, you know, that's just the same as the world. It's just another Australian idol. I mean, there's a million million people that that tried out for Australian Idol, and, you know, everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants the limelight. That's not what this Christian walk is all about. It's actually about demonstrating the kingdom everywhere we go. So what I want to give to you is something that is actually creating transformation in my life. It's not just something that I've gone, you know, I love what uh, Bill Johnson and uh, and, um, Bill Johnson and Chris Valentin talk about. They say they don't study to preach. They study to learn. They say that what feeds me feeds them. Uh, Chris Valentin gives the illustration of, you know, breastfeeding. He says that if, you, if you're just giving people a formula, you're creating formula Christians, but people that have actually digested this thing, they're living this thing out, then you have so much more to give. Um, let's just turn to 1 John. Man, I've just been camping in 1 John. It's just amazing. So much life there. <laughs> Apparently, one of, John, one, uh, one of John's, the Apostle John, uh, his disciples said to him, he says, John, do you speak about anything but love? And John's response was, is there anything else to talk about? Before we go there, let's just uh, let's read 
1 John chapter 3, uh, sorry, 1 John verse 3, 1 John 1 verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship it was with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and we write this to make our joy complete. That's an incredible invitation that I see. Here is John that actually was able to hear the very heartbeat of Jesus. He says, we've, we've felt him, we've ta- we tasted him, we, we've, we've experienced him with our hands, we've touched him, and we testify how, you know, Talk about somebody that is qualified to speak about Jesus. It's not somebody that's at a distance. You know, I think many times when we come to this Christian walk, it's like, you know, you want to kind of dis- distance people from you because you don't, wanna, you don't want people to really know the true you because we're not living in a place of freedom. But here is John who is closest to Jesus. He saw him and his Jesus didn't have ups and downs, but he saw him all the time. He got to live with him. He got to sleep with him. He got to lean on his chest, and he testifies, this is the Christ. This is the Son of the living God, the Word that has become flesh. Out of anybody, I feel that is qualified to talk about the nature of God because Jesus is actually the exact representation of the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. I only say what I hear the Father say, and I only do what I hear the Father see what I, <laughs> I only do what I see the Father doing. Amen? So here, we are, op- we are actually invited into that same fellowship with Him. Isn't that awesome? Okay, here's where I want to go. Let's go to 1 John 2. Let's just... Let's just do, do a bunch of reading here. Verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. For whoever says, I know him, that does not keep him as his commands is, is a liar, but the truth is not in that person. But every, if every, anyone obeys his word, the love of God is truly made complete in him. Or your translation may say, uh, being made perfect. And this is how we know him. Whoever, live, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That's the normal Christian life right there. Anyone who claims to live in Jesus must live as he did. Are you with me? Now, I think many times people could say, well, they begin to move into legalism here. And say, if we could keep our commands, it's like somebody that comes to you. Hey, man, if you really love me, then you would do this. So it's actually not increasing the love, it's cre- increasing the commands. But Jesus said, if you're connected into the vine and you're connected into his love, then you will produce fruit. So if you love me, then you will keep my commands. It's not about I'm going to try to prove my love for him, but I begin to focus on the source and abiding in his vine, and then naturally fruit begins to come from there. Because, I, because guess what? You are a good tree. If you're producing bad fruit, it's what Paul talks about. You put off the old, and you put on the new, and you recognize that the seed of God is within. It's not my nature to sin. It's the most liberating thing that, I have, that I've ever experienced in the whole world to begin to realize that I actually have been created with a new and a pure heart, that I've been cleansed with the blood of Jesus, and it's not in my nature any longer to sin. It's not in your nature. We've been lied to. The devil wants to tell you you're going to have this ongoing struggle within you till the day that you die and that you're liberated from this body of death and you get to heaven and finally you get there. But I tell you what, that is contrary to what the word of God is. It's the righteousness in Christ Jesus. It's liberation. When you recognize who you truly are, I am a good fr- a tree. So I begin to produce good fruit. Dear friends, in verse 7, I'm not writing you a new command, but, but an old one, which you've heard since the beginning. This old command is the message that you've heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. I love how John talks here. It's not a new command, but an old one, but it's a new one. Is that what you got from that? <laughs> The, uh, yes, I'm writing you a new command, but the truth is seen in him, in him and you, because darkness is passing and there's a true light that's already shining. When you begin to see the true light shining and revealing who you truly are. So many people, man, I, I just, I've got this thing on me. And it's just like, yeah, I, I, you know, I need no more deliverance. I mean, all of this sort of stuff. But if we could really, truly see who we we're created to be, then we will live like him. This, this, this is not, this, I, I'm beginning to taste this firsthand. There's freedom. 
Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. But anyone who loves his brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. Let me read that again. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing, somebody say nothing, nothing in them to make them stumble. Nothing in them to make them stumble. Whoa. I tell you what, I tell you what, this is, this, there's a radical reformation that's about to hit the church. We are not meant to be living in a place where, hey man, look, I was, re- I was going really, really well in God until this person crossed me. And then I went downhill. They said some nasty stuff to me. I, I was in this other church, and then people just hurt me. I was doing really, really good until this person came in my line of sight, and then they, man, if you, and then what, we, what happens is we begin to coddle these people and say, hey, man, that's really, I'm really sorry, man. They shouldn't have done that to you. And it actually gives permission for us to live in a place of, am, is this okay? Is this to go here? This, this is not easy stuff, but I tell you what. This is, there's freedom in this. There's absolute freedom. It says, if, they, if you abide in him, there is no place for us to stumble. That, that's different. That's contrary to, to, to church culture that I'm used to. That we actually can get to a place in him when we're abiding in the vine that no matter who comes towards, whoever says, slanders us, whoever backstabs us, whoever does this, that, or, or not, there's actually no place in me left to stumble. Are you with me? I believe that there's a change in perspective. There's two things that are going on as we begin to, to and, and this is what I, I'm tasting um, in my life. You know, I, I believe that a lot of the church has got the, um, the teaching on forgiveness. It's, a, it's, it's important. Amen. And people are feeling that they're, li- they're walking in a place of, for, this, is, this is how I was. Like if I could just ma- say, hey, look, God, look, there's people in my life that, um, that have done stuff to me, but I've forgiven them and I've let, let that go. There, there may be people that are like that even right now. I'll tell you what. There's so much more freedom in forgiveness. You know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. There's no freedom in it. There may be a slight bit of satisfaction if we're looking for a place of revenge or, or to take somebody down or to cut them down. But I think that a lot of people within the church, they've settled that thing in their heart. But I tell you what I, have, I hadn't settled in my heart is I believe that Jesus is not just calling us to forgiveness. Because you remember when the disciples came to Jesus. He said, how many times must I forgive my brother and sister? Seven times a day? And Jesus says what? Seventy times seven in a day. See, we're not just supposed to be living in a place of forgiveness from past things, people that have done past things. Imagine when we begin to live as Jesus did, and we begin to live in a state of perpetual forgiveness. I don't know if you're catching this. A state of, what does a state of perpetual forgiveness look like? It means that I have forgiven you even before you've done something towards me. There's so much freedom in that. I've forgiven you even if before you've... Because, you know, see the disciples, how many times, how many times must we forgive? Because I think that this is human nature. It's like, okay, if somebody's crossed, you've crossed me once, I'm going to take a little bit of time and I'm going to distance myself from you so that there's two things that are going on. Sometimes it can be a little bit of revenge. You hurt me, and so I'm, I'm, you're going to be at a distance. You stay at a distance so you can feel the pain. The other thing is you distance, we distance ourselves from people to protect our heart. Can I, can I just say this as well? I, I was one of the, um, I was a passive aggressive. My brother Grant blew up. He, he, you know, if you pushed him the wrong way, he would just, he would just say what he said. And he'd go aggro. And, but I wouldn't say anything. I was... I was but I would internalize it, and there was a lot of, I would actually begin to, to build up a lot of bitterness. And what, what I begin to learn along the way is if you begin to confront issues, then you can get it off your chest faster. 
And so that's better than I was living before because bitterness is just tears you apart. And so as you begin to, hey, man, look, look what, what you did there. It's just, you know, it, it just really hurt, it really hurt. And you can begin to say certain things. But I tell you what, this is different. This is different what, what John's talking about. It says that if we, abide in the, if we abide in the vine, if we abide in him in his love, then there will be no place for us to stumble. Look at Peter, for instance. You think, many, how, how many have heard it say, the closest people are the ones that hurt you the most? But yet, Paul says, Owe no man anything except for love. You see, many times, even that mentality in itself, can I, can I just be totally real? I feel like this, God's just shining this light and just, just revealing all this stuff. And it's, and it's painful in a way, but it's so liberating. It's much better living in freedom than trying to live in rights. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to tell you that right now. <laughs> But you look at Jesus, this is how forgiveness looked like for him. Here's Peter. Remember, Jesus said, if you deny me before God, I, before men, I will deny you before God. And Jesus warned him, he said, Peter, before this night, you're going to deny me. And Peter, so not only was he was confronted, people because, you know, we have higher expectations when we say, hey, don't you do this to me, and then they do that towards them. Are you with me? Not only did he do that, but Peter says, that will never happen. I will, I will die first. And then Peter is taken up by this, this thing. And remember the conversation with, with the woman. And the, you're, you're one of them. You, you've got a Galilean accent. And let me got that. And he says, I do not know the man. And says that Jesus saw him. And he looked at him. But you see, Jesus, I guarantee you, that Jesus was not looking at him in pain for himself. He was walking in a place of forgiveness. That Peter, I have forgiven you even before you've done that to me. 70 times 7, that means that, you know, many times we can go, hey, look, man, you cross, I'm going to forgive you this time. But if you do this the second time, what I found is that people that have the higher, uh, the higher, um, what's the word? A higher realization, a higher understanding High, awareness is the word that I'm looking for. People that have the higher awareness of our rights and our expectations can be directly linked with the offense that we carry. Are you with me? You see, the more aware of my rights that I have, and this, this is where I think that, that even there's a whole lot of Christian psychology stuff that is, that is accommodating the flesh. It says, make no allowance for the flesh. And so this is, this is what I found. The people that, that have been uh, uh, taken advantage of or whatever, and, and, they, and they begin to create uh, walls because it's, there's so much pain. If they went any further, then, then, then they would probably die. It's just too painful. So they begin to build walls around them to pre protect them from other people. But I tell you what, when we get united into Jesus, then we get free. We get free from ourselves. We abide in Him, and there's no place for us to stumble. This is an, this is an act. I, I don't know if you've... I, is this too much for a Friday night? <laughs> Are you ready for this? <laughs> because it's actually going to take giving up everything. <sighs> it feels good to have rights, but it feels so much better to be free. Yeah. Jesus looked at him, he loved him. He forgave him even before that happened, 70 times seven. If we could live in a place of perpetual forgiveness, that I have forgiven you even before you've done whatever you've done to me because there's no place for stumbling in me any longer. 
Because the, the greater the awareness that I have of my rights, the potential is to begin to walk out in a, in a greater realm of offense. But we are meant to live full of love, full of hope, full of life. We walk as Jesus did. Do you know, Sydney is known for, you know, for some of the worst traffic in the world. But it's also known for, for some of the worst road rage in the world. I lived in China and the traffic is worse there and there is no road rage. Why? Are you with me? In Sydney, road rage is horrible. And they drive better in Sydney than they do in China. In China, oh, you, you take three seconds, somebody's going to cut you off. You have, it's not just you're cruising along with your headphones in and then you, you shoulder check and see if you need, like people will cut you off. You have to be riding your brake constantly. I thought it was normal when I was growing up there. And then I came over to Australia, took my license and went back there. What the heck? I got into the first cab and I'm like, what is happening here? You know, you'd have, you have two, like a, a two-way street. Two lanes going that way, two lanes going the other way. And then there will be a stop sign and then it will become a one-way street. And then you have an intersection and you got cars coming in from eight different angles. And they're just speeding towards and then they basically play a game of chicken. So you just, you know, if you know that you're going to hit the car in front of you, then you slam on the brakes. And the one that gets through is the one that knows, you know, you've got a sort of a little bit of an edge in. But the thing is that there is no road rage in China because they don't, are not aware of their rights that we have in Australia is that nobody crosses me. If you get me to tap my brakes, I'm going to go off at you. Right? We are so aware of our rights. Don't you dare cross me. This is, my, this is my time. This is my money. This is my car here. I'm driving along, along on the highway. And you came and you made me tap my brakes. And now I'm going off my head with you. I don't know. Does that ever happen to you? It's happened to me before. But you see, when we begin to relinquish our rights, this is what my, my, my dad... He got, a, he got a, um, uh, a license in China. It's just like, he said, it's freedom. You know, the people, there's no expectations. You just drive. <laughs> drive how you like, you want to drive, but you don't live in a place of offense because that's what's expected. You, it's not your right to, to, you know, to be in one lane and have not have somebody to cut you off. And so you live in peace. You just make sure that you watch the road and you tap your brakes and you don't get angry. <laughs> Let me give you some verses. I've really been chewing on this thing. Verse, uh, uh, John 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for one's friends. Uh, in Philippians 2, 3, Paul says, Do nothing <clears throat> from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his, only, his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Though he was, in the, he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the 